Israel and his people, the Jews. Now, at this point, we don't know when it begins. We don't know when it ends. We just know that it's a part of the 2300 days and that it's the key to understanding that vision. But it's 70 weeks sort of out in isolation. Look at the rest of verse 24. He gives him six things that needed to take place in this period of time. How many things? Six, six things. And we all wrote them down last night. They're all found in verse 24. Here they are. Let's go through them quickly. To finish the transgression. To make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now that should immediately cause us to think. We've already been learning about the sanctuary, and there are how many compartments in the sanctuary? Three compartments. What's the first? Courtyard, then the holy place, then the most holy place. So look at that language is used right there. To anoint the most holy. That's a reference to the most holy place of the sanctuary. So he says, 70 weeks are cut off for your people, Daniel, to accomplish these six things that must transpire in this allotted time. Now look at the next verse. Verse 25. Know therefore and, there it is again, understand that from the command going forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto who? Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Okay? So 62 and 7 is what? 69. 69. So he says, know this, Daniel. 70 weeks are cut off for your people. And from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time that the Messiah the Prince will come is 69 weeks. Now, so far, is this pretty simple, everyone? Yes or no? It's actually very simple. We have a time period, and now we actually have a starting point for that time period. Now, beloved, who is the Messiah? Jesus Christ. The word Messiah comes from the Hebrew Mashiach, which means the one who is anointed. The Greek word Christ means anointed. Keep your finger right here in Daniel and go with me very quickly to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Now, we alluded to this last night, and I did mention this scripture, but I want you to see it there on your own. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Peter is speaking. He's actually preaching to a group of Gentiles, a man by the name of Cornelius. And we pick it up in verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Make note of this. This is, it is in your study guide. It's right there in your study guide. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says, Peter preaching, how God anointed, how God what? Anointed who? Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth with what? Holy the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil and God was with him. Now, according to Peter here, God anointed Jesus with the what? The Holy Spirit. Now, question, when was Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit? At his baptism, that's exactly right. Remember, he went down there into the muddy waters of the River Jordan. He said to his elder cousin, John, John, I need you to baptize me. Baptize you? Are you kidding? I can't even un untie your shoes or unlatch your sandals. I need you to baptize me. Suffer it to be so for now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And he baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, there was a voice from heaven. Behold, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And then something happened. What happened next? There was a dove, uh, uh, what looked to be like a dove, that descended upon Jesus, and that was the Holy Spirit. Peter here says that when that Holy Spirit fell upon him, he was anointed. He was anointed with the Spirit. Now, how many of you have heard that language before, anointed? Anointed, okay. And when we anoint most often, what do we use to anoint? We use oil, that's right. But beloved, that oil in the Bible is a symbol of guess what? Holy Spirit, I've anointed many people and we take olive oil and we put it on their head or we put it on their hands. But beloved, there's no power in olive oil. Amen. Amen. I mean, sure, there are medicinal properties and there's, there's uh, those kinds of things. But as far as spiritual power, there's nothing spiritually powerful about olive oil. What it is, is that it represents the Holy Spirit. So when you're anointed with oil, that's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was anointed with the real McCoy at his baptism. Amen. Amen. Now, I want you to think about something. We call Jesus, Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ wasn't his name. That's not the name his mother gave him. Okay? Jesus Christ. When we say Jesus Christ, what we're saying is Jesus 
the anointed. Does that make sense? And so he would have been Jesus at the age of 15, the age of 20, he's Jesus, the age of 21, he's Jesus, the age of 25, he's Jesus, until one day he's there at his father's carpenter's bench and he knows, he has a sense because he's been studying the prophecies of Daniel and the Spirit of God says, now is the time. And he leaves the carpenter's bench and he would have gone down to that river and he would have been anointed and then he becomes Jesus Christ, the anointed, and the Hebrew word is Messiah. So far so good, everyone? Very good. Okay. Now, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 457 B.C., we talked about that date a little bit last night, you read Ezra chapter 7, until Messiah the Prince is 69 weeks. 69 weeks is one week less than 70. 70 weeks is 490, so you just subtract one week, which would give you up. 483. So if you move 483 years from 457 B.C., you come to 27 A.D. What event happened in 27 A.D.? Jesus was baptized. Jesus was baptized. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah, beloved. Our message last night was entitled, Perfect Prophetic Proof of Jesus Christ's Identity. People say, how do you know he's the guy? He's the guy because he was baptized right on time. And then he gave multitudinous evidences of his identity, of his uniqueness, and we find those in the gospel accounts. He was baptized right on time. Now let's continue here. If you're following along, this is going just exactly along with your study guide. Jesus was baptized by John in 27 AD, the fall of 27 AD. Okay, the fall of 27 AD. Just as Daniel 9.25 had foretold. Now let's continue here. We're there in our verse, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now look at verse 26. This is new information. We're done reviewing. We're moving into new territory. Verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Does everyone see that? Messiah will be what? cut off, and the literal here, in the original language, it means the Messiah will be killed. The Messiah would be cut off. The idea was that he would be cut off from the land of the living. In the middle of the week, Messiah would be cut off. In the what of the week? The middle of the week, the Messiah would be cut off. Now look at this. But not for himself. Can you say Amen. When Jesus Christ died on Golgotha's tree, did he die for his sins? No. Whose sins did he die for? Our sins. So it says in the middle of the week, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus died on that tree, beloved, not because he had sinned, not because he had transgressed, not because he had any iniquity that needed to be taken away, but for our sins, our iniquities, and our transgressions. Can you say amen? So right there, it says that he would be baptized after the 69 weeks, but then in the middle of the week, he'd be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus was baptized in the fall of 27 A.D., the fall of 27 A.D., okay? Now follow this through. 26. After the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And you're saying, whoa, you lost me there. Don't let me lose you. It's not difficult to understand. Don't get lost in all of the syllables. It's very simple. The middle of the week, Messiah would be cut off and then the city would be destroyed. Let's say that together. Messiah would be cut off, and then what happens? City is destroyed. Get that sequence indelibly in your mind, okay? Messiah's cut off, and then the city is destroyed. Okay, let's follow this through here. The Messiah would be cut off in the middle of the week. Jesus' public ministry lasted exactly three and a half years. Now, look at my fingers here. I'll see if I can do it for you. Jesus was baptized in the fall of 27 AD, okay? So the fall of 28, that would be how many years? One year. Fall of 29... Two years. Fall of 30. What comes after fall? Winter. Winter and then spring. spring. So that would be a half of a year. Jesus was crucified right on time in the spring of 31 AD at the time of the Passover. Can you say amen? 
Now you go read, in fact, it's right there in your study guide. There were many times where the enemies of Jesus tried to lay hands on him to do him harm. And Jesus would slip out of their midst supernaturally as the angels would carry him, as the angels would escort him, and he would say very strange things like this. My time has not yet come. Yet then one day when he was in Gethsemane there praying and that mob came up and Judas betrayed him with a kiss, he willingly allowed himself to be taken into their uh, 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 hands. He willingly allowed himself to be betrayed. And he said, why do you come to me with sticks and staves? Why do you come to me with these things? Wasn't I daily teaching in your temples? Jesus on many other occasions had escaped... Peter tried to get him to escape, didn't he, when he cut that guy's ear off with the sword. And Jesus said, hey, listen, don't you think that right now I could ask my father and he would send legion upon legion of angels? Why did Jesus allow himself to be turned over at that time? Because he knew his time had come. He say amen? So look at that. He was... Baptized in the fall of 27, so 28 is 1, 29 is 2, 30 is 3, and then you go to the winter, and then the spring, that's three and a half years. What does the Bible say? In the middle of the week, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Can you say amen? For God so loved the world, beloved, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus paid the penalty for my sins and for your sins, and he did it right on time. Amen. Powerful. Now, let's remember that sequence. Messiah is cut off, and then what happened? City, city is destroyed. Messiah is cut off, the city is destroyed. Messiah is cut off, the city is destroyed. What happened when Jesus died there? There was a great earthquake. And, and, and in the temple... The veil, the what? The, the Bible says the veil was torn. You've got it. That's exactly right, Angelo. From top to bottom. Now, why from top to bottom? What's the significance there? Why is that detail recorded? Think of it this way. If a man, I mean, that temple was some 30 feet, or that curtain was some 30 feet tall. If a man was going to tear that temple, he would tear it from bottom to top. But it says that it was torn from top to bottom, showing that God was the one who tore that veil. Why? Why, why, why? why tearing the veil? Because that veil was, was right there in the very heart of the temple where the lambs were slain, the sacrifices that were carried out. And we've already answered this question. I know you know the answer, but I'm going to ask it again. Did those bulls and those goats and those lambs and those rams, could they take away any sins? No. Their importance was not in their own efficacy, but as in they pointed forward to who? Jesus. And so when Jesus, the true Lamb of God, died on Golgotha's hill, God said, no more sacrifices. Unnecessary because the true Lamb has come. The veil was rent, not from the bottom to the top. That's how a man would have done it. But from the top to the bottom. And God said, I am satisfied with this final sacrifice. Amen. You say amen? amen? Now, look at this. This gets absolutely amazing. Look at verse 27. We'll come back to the destruction of the city in just a moment. Verse 27. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. What covenant? God had a covenant with the Jews. Amen? God had a covenant with Israel. They were to be his chosen people and he was to be their God. I mean, how many times in the Old Testament do you find him saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be your God and you will be my people. And Jesus comes down to confirm that covenant, to give them one last chance. He comes to confirm that covenant for a week. But what happens in the middle of the week? Was he received? When they began to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna to David, Hosanna to the son of David, did, did all of the religious leaders and the religious hierarchy run out and accept him as the promised Messiah? No. They crucified him. In the middle of the week, he was cut off, but not because he was guilty. Because you were guilty. Look at the rest of that verse, verse 27. But in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to what? Sacrifice. sacrifice and offering. He'll bring an end to... How does he bring an end to sacrifice and offering? When the true lamb dies, is there any need to bring a lamb now that points forward to Jesus? No, because now Jesus has come. He is the one. 
What did John say? Behold the Lamb of, Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So when Jesus came and when he died, he puts an end to sacrifice and God symbolized that. God sanctioned that. God solidified that and crystallized that by tearing that veil from top to bottom saying it's over. And Jesus cried out, it is finished. Now some of you have heard that this prophecy has to do with the Antichrist. And you've been waiting for an Antichrist to come to some earthly temple and to stop the Jews from offering sacrifices, beloved. You can believe that if you want. You, you can believe that if you want to follow fictitious adventure fiction novels about the Bible. But if you want to know what the Bible is teaching, this prophecy has nothing to do with the Antichrist and everything to do with Jesus Christ. This isn't about the Antichrist putting an end to the sacrifices of the Jews. This is about Jesus Christ putting an end to all sacrifice when he died on Golgotha's tree. And God, God powerfully endorsed that when he tore that temple from top to bottom. And it says he'd put an end to sacrifice and offering. You say amen? And it's, it's just as plain as the noonday sun. The word Antichrist does. There, there is no Antichrist here in chapter 9. I want to be a little careful. There are Antichrist allusions in chapter 9, but right here we're talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? Now look at this. It says the last part. This is going to wrap up Daniel 9 for us. On the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And you say, whoa, lost me there again. The last part of 26 and the last part of 27 foretell the destruction of the city. The destruction of the what, everyone? The destruction of the city. Let's look at our chart here. Very simple. Seventy weeks were allotted for the who? For the Jews. Seventy weeks were allotted for the who? Jews. Jews. That's what Gabriel said. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your city. Seventy weeks were cut off for them. After 69 weeks, the Messiah would come. Was Jesus baptized right on time? Yes or no? In the middle of the week, he would be what? Cut off, but not for himself. And he would cause sacrifice and offering to cease. Okay? Now, those of you who are attentive, you're noticing that there's still another three and a half years at the end of this, isn't there? Absolutely. We're only halfway through that final week. Perfect prophetic proof of Jesus' identity and of his historical uniqueness. Jesus of Nazareth is, in fact, the Messiah. Now, notice this. 34 A.D., right? Because he was baptized in the fall of 27 A.D., he was crucified in the spring of 31 A.D. He was the Passover that was slain for us. Amen? And then you go another three and a half years out. That would bring you to the fall of 34 A.D. To keep it very, very simple, if you just go 70 weeks or 490 years from 457, you would come right down to 34 A.D. This decree was passed in the fall by Artaxerxes, and this ends in the fall of 34 A.D. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. What happened in the fall of 34 A.D.? Jesus was already in heaven. It's a very good question. Very, very good question. Go with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 7 and 8. Acts chapter 7 and 8. A man by the name of Stephen. What was his name, everyone? Stephen, Stephen was stoned. Stephen was what? Stoned. stoned. And if you read this powerful in Acts chapter 7 and 8, Stephen is addressing himself to the highest religious council in the land. And he basically raises significant objections to their rejection of the Messiah. And instead of receiving Stephen's admonitions, the Bible says they took him out and they stoned him. Stephen is the first Christian martyr. Stephen is the first, what did I say? Christian martyr. He was stoned in 34 A.D. Now, scholars have noticed something very interesting. This is not in your notes, so you might want to write this down. And if you can't get it, do your best. Stephen's final speech contained four very important elements. It's not just one of those things that's recorded for posterity's sake. Something very significant, something very important, and something theologically monumental taking place in Stephen's sermon. Number one. He delivered this sermon to the Sanhedrin council that was the highest religious body in the land. In other words, he delivered it to the top. It would be like addressing, giving an address to the Congress and the Senate and the executive branch, the President of the United States. He addressed this to the highest religious body in the land, number one. Number two, 
The speech, if you follow it through, if you, if you look at it, it's really kind of interesting because really what he's arguing for is that Jesus was the Messiah, but he begins way back in the time of Abraham. And he walks through Abraham, and he walks through Moses, and he walks through all of the patriarchs, and then he ends at Jesus. And you think, why is he doing that? Scholars have noted that what Stephen is doing here is he is modeling his sermon, his presentation, after a covenant lawsuit. After a what? Covenant lawsuit. What's a covenant? It's an agreement. A covenant is an agreement. So if I have a covenant here with Earl, and I say, Earl, I'm going to do this, and you're going to do that, and we have a covenant, today we would call that a contract. Right, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, a contract. You know, back in the day, I would just shake his hand, and he'd shake mine, and we'd call it good, because a man's word was his bond. But nowadays, we have contracts and lawyers and all of this paraphernalia. But the point is this. If there's a violation there, then I could raise a lawsuit, or he could raise a lawsuit against me. God had a covenant with his people. God had a what? Covenant with his people, and he had extended this covenant now uh, from the very beginning. Of course, Abraham would have been the first of the Jews, but then he, Gabriel had said, 70 more weeks are determined, decreed, cut off for your people, and here at the end of that, Stephen now delivers this marvelous sermon that scholars have recognized was basically like the covenant lawsuits that the prophets preached in the Old Testament. What he was saying is, this is it. This is your last chance right here, right now. And he traces all the evidences through. I summon exhibit A. I summon exhibit B. I summon exhibit C. I summon exhibit D. And he traces all the way down. And here's their chance. The crux of the moment, the crucible of the matter, right then, right there. And instead of receiving it, the Bible actually says something very interesting in Acts 7 and 8. It says they stopped their ears. Did you know that? The Bible says they stopped their ears. And they rushed on him, gnashing him with their teeth, and they killed him. So number one, it was delivered to the highest religious body in the land. Number two, it was modeled after a covenant lawsuit. Number three, the prophetic element of his looking into heaven and seeing Jesus at God's right hand confirms his message. You're there in Acts chapter 7. Actually, look at Acts chapter 7, the last little part there. Verse 54, Acts chapter 7, what verse everyone? Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Can you think of anything you'd rather see as you're just about ready to breathe your last breath than that? Yeah. Verse 56, and he said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their what? Ears symbolically saying, we're not interested in this Jesus. They stopped their ears. Look at the rest of this. They ran, out with, they ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city. And what did they do? They stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God. And he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had done this, he fell asleep. Now, it doesn't mean he took a nap. He died. Now, beloved, God was confirming that Stephen's message was true when he gave Stephen that prophetic vision of Jesus at, at God's right hand. Amen? Amen. That's number three. And number four, Paul's conversion has its root in Stephen's stoning. It says it right there. They laid their coats. You know, oh, we got to take our coats off as we stone this heretic. And they laid those coats where? At Saul's feet. Paul's conversion has its root in, roots in Stephen's stoning. This marks a transition from Israel only to include the Gentiles. Just go read the book of Acts. Acts chapters 10 and 11 and onward, the gospel begins to go like wildfire to the Gentiles. Amen. To the who? Gentiles. Why is God turning to the Gentiles? Because the Jews, listen carefully now, not as individuals, but the Jews as a nation, as a religious, religio-political national entity had officially closed the covenant, had lost the lawsuit, and had been moved beyond are we all together on that? So then the gospel begins to go to the Gentiles. It's basically like saying, hey, listen, if you're not going to pay attention, we'll talk to the people who will. And that's basically the whole book of Acts is the, the apostle 
Paul on his missionary journeys. And where is he going? He's going to strange places, Ephesus and Rome and Antioch and all over Asia Minor. Why? Because he's taking the good news of a crucified and risen Savior to the Gentile communities. Can you say amen? amen. Why, why did it happen at that time? Because the, the time that was allotted for the Jews as a nation, as a what? As a nation. I want to underscore that. As a nation. Can God still save Jewish people today? Of course he can, as they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as a nation, shh, the gospel begins to go to the Gentile communities. Absolutely powerful. Let's continue on here. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD as God's judgment. As God's what? Judgment, judgment upon Israel and Jerusalem for its rejection of the Messiah. Now remember I told you what was that sequence? Messiah rejected City destroyed. Let's say it together. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. Now, we've already seen that in Daniel chapter 9. Go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And I want to read this to you real quick. Okay, we'll see how fast Pastor Asherick can read. Matthew chapter 21. I'm in verse 33. Matthew 21, verse 33. Are we there? Matthew 21, verse 33. I want everybody there. Follow along. Here we go. Jesus says, Hear another parable. He's speaking to the religious leaders of his day. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it. He dug a wine press in it and he built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Last of all, he sent his son, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard. And what did they do? They killed him. Therefore, when the owner of that vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Do you know what this parable is teaching, yes or no? This is a simple parable. God set up the nation of Israel. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. And most of those prophets were ignored and rejected. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Very broad sweep of Israel's history. And last of all, he sent his son. But what happened to the son? He was killed. Is there any question in anyone's mind what this prophecy is about? Now watch this. Phenomenal. Verse 41. They said to him, because remember Jesus has said, hey, what, what would the guy do? When he comes back, what would he do? Look at verse 41. They said to him, he will, what's the next word? Destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render him the fruits in their seasons. Do you see it? The son was rejected and destruction comes. Son is rejected. What comes? Destruction comes. And notice what Jesus says here. Jesus said to them, whoa, whoa, whoa. Haven't you read in the scriptures? Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Look at verse 43. What's the first word of verse 43? Therefore, therefore and when you see the word therefore, ask yourself, what's that therefore? Here's Jesus' conclusion based on this parable and based on their own condemnation of themselves. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Beloved, if language has meaning, what Jesus is saying is, after you reject me as God's son, the privileges and the prerogatives of the kingdom will be taken from you and given to another nation. Right. If language has meaning, what else could that verse possibly mean? Look at this. Verse 44, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken. That stone, of course, is Jesus Christ, but on whomsoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And look at verse 45. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Did they know what he was talking about? Yeah, and what, they didn't like it one bit. Verse 46, and they sought to lay hands on him. They sought to do the very thing that he just said in the parable would happen. Beloved, what was the sequence? Messiah rejected City destroyed. Go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Look at the last three verses of Matthew chapter 23. Here we go. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Verse 37. 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not what? Never forget it, God is a gentleman. He will not force his way into your life. He needs you to be willing to let him in. Amen? God won't violate your free will. He has to work with your free will. He says, I wanted to do this. You were not willing. Verse 38, see your house is left to you what? 
desolate, for you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus walks out of the temple precincts for the last time. They had rejected persistently the evidences of his Messiahship. And he says, look, I'm not going to bend your arm and make you accept me. I'm out of here. You won't see me again until you see me in glory. What's the very next thing that happens? Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. The disciples come, uh, when Jesus departed from the temple, his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Verse 2, Jesus says, stop trying to cheer me up with the temple. Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one what? Stone will be left here upon another that will not be what? Thrown out. What's he talking about? The destruction of the temple and of the city. Beloved, three times, three times in Daniel chapter 9, Messiah was rejected, city was destroyed. Where did Jesus get his theology from? He knew the prophecies of Daniel. Jesus had to learn just like you and I learn, Amen. I mean, he studied the scriptures. He, he had to sit and memorize. He had to know when the devil came to tempt him there, it is written, he said, it is written, he said, it is written. He knew. How did he know? He studied like you and I study. Surely he was God and surely he was a man, but he knew what it was to walk a mile in my moccasins. Amen? And so in Daniel chapter 9, Jesus knew it. The Messiah would be rejected, cut off in the middle of the week, and the city is destroyed. So he tells a parable in Matthew chapter 21. Hey, listen, there was a vineyard, and, and he leased it out, and, and he sent out his servants, and they rejected the servants. And then he sent out his son, and they rejected the son. What would you do? And they said, oh, destruction. He says, that's right. Messiah is rejected. City is destroyed. And then in Matthew chapter 24, he says, hey, your house is left to you desolate. I'm out of here. What, what, what more can I do? I wanted to gather you. you you're not willing. And he walks out and he goes up on Mount Olivet. The disciples come to cheer him up and he says, you know what's going to happen to this city? It's going to be destroyed. Now, if that sequence is clear, I want you to say amen. amen. Messiah's rejected, city's destroyed. Three times. Messiah rejected, city destroyed. So there it is in 34 AD, right there. You say, what happened in 34 AD? It's very simple what happened in 34 AD. Stephen was stoned in 34 AD, thus symbolizing the closing of the covenant. And listen to my language because I'm not going to stutter, or at least I'm planning on not stuttering, and that is this. The Jewish nation as a nation, as a what words did I say? As a nation ceased to have the special prerogatives and significance that it had before God up to that time. When they stoned Stephen, when their covenant was confirmed, when they rejected the Messiah, and when that city was destroyed, can Jews still be saved? Yes. Sure. Can Jamaicans still be saved? Can Russians can be saved? Armenians. That's why the Bible, that Romanians, my wife's Romanian, she can be saved. Armenians. Armenians can be saved too, why not? What God is saying here in the New Testament is he's no longer a respecter of persons. Amen. Amen? We have equal access to God, and so Jews can still be saved, but the Jews as a nation. 34 AD, the stoning of Stephen. What did Jesus say? Therefore, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will bear the fruits. Powerful, very simple. So, what happens after 34 AD? The, is the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Gospel's going to the Gentiles. I'm a Gentile, beloved. I mean, by, by nature, I don't think I have any genealogical relationship to Abraham. Maybe I do, some way back. But I'm a Gentile, and, and I'm a Jew by faith. I'm a follower of Abraham by faith. Amen. Listen, I'm looking out here today and I see a whole lot of Gentile faces. You better praise the Lord that the gospel went to the Gentiles. Amen? Amen Powerful. So the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Now, the church carried the gospel to the Jews, to the Gentiles and beyond. Now, buckle your safety belts. Okay, do you have your safety belts buckled there? Okay, here we go. The 70 weeks were part of the what? The 2300 days. Remember? Remember? Gabriel came back to explain the 2300 days that Daniel didn't understand. And he explains it by saying, here is the beginning. Here's something that will happen with the Messiah. Here's when he'll be cut off. Here's when the, the, the gospel will go to the Gentiles. He gives them a template. A what did I say? Template. template. Any construction workers here this evening? Anybody knows how to work on a house? Okay. Okay. Now listen, if you have a template, let's just say here that I'm going to put in a fence. Okay, I'm going to put in a fence, and um, I'm going to line all of the other fences off. Say I have a template here that has a mark here, a mark here, a mark here, and then down here a mark, and then a mark, and then a mark here. And someone has told me, if you line this template up with this, this, and this, if you line these three up, the rest will fall into place. Amen. 
Is that how a template works? Very simple. If this part works, you can calibrate the system with ease. And so what we're going to do is we're going to lay that down. We're going to lay that template down and we're going to allow what we know the prophecy means to calibrate the rest of it. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? That's exactly why Gabriel said to him, hey, listen, here are unmistakable events that are going to take place. The Messiah will come. The Messiah will be cut off. The covenant will be closed. Okay, so one, yep, got it. Mm -hmm. Here's the beginning, got it, yep. And two, yep, got it. And number three, yep, got it. So now we're just going to lay that template down and see where it takes us. Is this making sense, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, here we go. Powerful. So 2,300 days, which is a day in Bible prophecy, is a what? Year minus the 490 years would leave us how much? 1,810. That's what would be left over. Because remember, the 490 is part of the 2,300. Okay, we've laid down the 70 weeks. We know where that goes. So now we've just got to lay this down. Here's our events. 457 brings us to 27 AD. Was Jesus baptized here? Yeah. yeah. The middle of the week was Jesus cut off, but not for himself? Did he cause sacrifice and oblation to cease? Yeah. Absolutely. Then he, three and a half years later, Stephen is stoned. The end of the, the special covenantal relationship with the Jews right here, 70 weeks. Again, I want to emphasize God can still save Jews as long as they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay? By the way, don't get too hung up on that whole thing. We're going to preach a whole sermon entitled, Who is Real is Real. Did you get that? Who is real is real. We're going to preach that whole sermon. But let me just tell you one thing. People get really hung up on this. But one day, John the Baptist, John the Baptist was standing there on the banks of the River Jordan, and he said, hey, listen, don't begin to say within yourselves that we have Abraham as our father. I'm telling you something. God could raise up children unto Abraham from these stones. God can raise up children. If God can raise up children to Abraham from the stones, then surely he can raise up children unto Abraham from believers and people. Amen? So we'll have a whole message entitled, Who is Real is Real. So we lay this down. Here's the 70 weeks. Here's the what? 70 weeks. And so here's our 1,810 1, years that remains, right? Because you subtract, we've done that. So 457, whoop, we follow this all the way down. And it takes us to 1844 A.D., and you say, whoa, whoa, what happened in 1844 A.D.? Well, that's a good question. Let's go answer it. Jesus Christ is our high priest. A amen? amen? Anyone unclear on that? Jesus Christ is our what? High priest. And if you'd like to open your Bible to the book of Hebrews, you can do that just now. Hebrews in the New Testament after the T's. Jesus Christ is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. How many sanctuaries are there, everyone? There were two. There was an earthly and a heavenly. Just as this prophecy foretells the opening hour of Jesus Christ's ministry, when he'd be baptized, so too it reveals the closing hour of his ministry. Now you're thinking, closing hour of his ministry? Help me to understand that. Okay, I'm going to do my very best. We've been through this. Now, okay, that, we don't probably need to go right through that. Okay, I thought I had it here, but I don't. I'll just have to pretend like I have it. You imagine with me. Okay, here's our three-part sanctuary. What's the first part? courtyard, then the holy place, and then the most holy place. Now, that was just a little dance that God made up out in the wilderness to keep them busy, right? Those things pointed forward to Jesus. And so on the cross, that symbolized the courtyard where the penalty was paid. Remember that? And then we come into the holy place. And what were the three things in the holy place? There was the candlestick and the table of showbread and the altar of incense representing Holy Spirit, prayer, or pardon me, Holy Spirit, prayer, and the Word of God, the bread of life, Jesus Himself. Okay? And then what was on the other side of that curtain? The most holy place. And what's in there? The Ark of the Covenant. And so this was foreshadowing what Jesus would do in His ministry. A amen? I mean, Jesus is our high priest in heaven. Any question about that? And so when Jesus ascends, He ascends into the heavenly sanctuary. And then here he's going to transition into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to cleanse the sanctuary. Amen. To what? Cleanse. Cleanse. Hey, that's exactly what we read in Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. How long will this be? And then he says in verse 14, to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. What sanctuary? The heavenly sanctuary, of course. It's the only one in existence at that time. So let's continue here. You move all the way down and hear Jesus Christ entering into the final phase of his ministry. He's like, whoa, that's amazing, absolutely amazing. But does it fit? Oh, it fits perfectly. Look at our quick review here. Daniel chapter 2, right? What do we have here? Babylon, then? Medo-Persia, then? Greece, then? Rome, then? 
Divided Rome, okay? And then here, what do we have here? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then what came up out, what came up out of those ten horns? A little horn, and then what was the very next thing we saw? Remember our threefold sequence? Rome, little horn, judgment. So does it fit? Yes or no? Oh, sure, it fits right there. Because the little horn reigned from when? 538 to 1798. 1,260 years coming to an end in 1798. Okay? So, so too here in Daniel 8. We have Medo-Persia, which was the ram. We have Greece, which was the goat. Pagan Rome, which was the horizontal element of the little horn. Little horn, which makes its uh, boast against God, God's sanctuary, God's people, God's truth, God's son. And then what happens? The sanctuary is cleansed, corresponding with the... Judgment, of course, as we've already discussed. There were how many services in the, heavenly, in, the, in the earthly sanctuary? Two. Remember, the sin was going in 359 days out of the year. How many days? And it was going what? In. It was going in. But then on the day of atonement, that sin had to be taken out. Are we all clear? And so Jesus Christ, as our high priest, would enter the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Why? To begin to cleanse and to judge just before his return. Do you hear what I said? Just before his what? Return. return. Now, this is the longest time prophecy in all the Bible. You cannot find a longer time prophecy in the whole Bible than that one. Now, look at our significantly important prophetic times here. Look at how it all fits together powerfully. Here's some of our dates. 457 to 34 AD is the time especially lauded for the Jews. How do we know that that's right? Because it lines up perfectly with the baptism, death of the Messiah, and the decree, uh, or pardon me, the closing of the covenant here and the gospel going to the Gentiles. So this is a lock. We've also seen that here are 1,260 years was the reign of the papacy from 538 AD until 1798 when it received a deadly wound. So far so good, everyone? And here we move from 457 all the way down, 2300 prophetic days or literal years, drops us in 1844 A.D. Is that after the reign of the little horn, yes or no? Yeah, because it has to come after the little horn, so it has to be after 1798. But it has to be before the second coming. Now, this gets powerful. Open your Bibles. I had you in Hebrews, but we didn't go there. Go to Revelation. Okay, Revelation. Revelation, chapter 6. What chapter? chapter six. 6. Now, we've already read this verse once. We're going to read it again. Revelation, chapter 6. We're in verse 10. Revelation, chapter 6, verse 10. We'll pick it up in verse 9. We've already read this. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had held. Verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you what? judge. So they were waiting for the judgment, the vindication of God and his cause and of them because they had been slain because they clung to the word. So they're saying, how long? Hey, that was the same question in Daniel chapter 8. How long? Now look at Revelation chapter 14. Quick question. Had the judgment begun when they were crying out how long? It couldn't have because they wouldn't be saying what? How long till it starts? But look what happens in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. John sees these mighty angels. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is going to come. Yes. Woo! You never saw that before, did you? The hour of His judgment what? Yes. It, what tense is that? That's present tense. Whoa, the hour of his judgment is come. And you think, oh, well, well, really? Yeah, really. The hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. I'm going to follow this all the way through. Verse 8, the next angel, another angel followed them saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You say, what does that mean? Keep coming and I'll tell you what it means. That's the second angel, Babylon has fallen. Verse 9, then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his 
hand. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of, faith of Jesus. Now watch this. Verse 14. What's the next thing John sees? Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and one on the cloud sat like the Son of Man. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. What's a sickle for? Harvesting. Verse 15, another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time is come. The what has come? The, see, God operates everything on a schedule. Amen? The time has come, notice what it says, for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Verse 16, so he who sat on the cloud thrust in a sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. What's being described here? What event is that? That's the second coming. Amen. Didn't we read that in Matthew chapter 13? Let both grow together until the harvest. And here in Revelation chapter 14, it says the time for the harvest is here. Go get him, Jesus. And he's sending out his angels and he's reaping those that are putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and those that aren't are being excluded. Now, here's the thing I want you to see. What comes first, 6 or 14? What comes first? You're counting. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So 6 comes before 14. Go back and read verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. You know what that means? There will be a time before the harvest, right? Is that before the harvest? Yes or no? There will be a time before the harvest that people will be saying, The judgment is come. Not the judgment is coming, but the judgment is come. Beloved, you and I are living in that judgment hour. We are living in the final phase of Jesus' ministry. Jesus was the lamb. Amen? But when he returns the second time, he's not a lamb. Amen? And Jesus was the priest. Amen? We've already looked at that. He's the high priest. Right? Here he's the lamb. Died on that altar. And he goes in here and he's our priest, right? Mediating for us and interceding for us. As Paul said, he ever lives to make intercession for us. And then he moves. There's only three phases, beloved. When Jesus Christ moves into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, you say, well, the most holy place is in the heavenly sanctuary. Look at, you're still there in Revelation 14. Look at it. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter what? 11. Give me two minutes and this is done. Maybe three. Revelation chapter 11. Verse 19, Revelation verse 11, chapter 11, verse 19, John says, Then the temple of God was opened where? In heaven. in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. What was seen in his temple? The ark of the covenant. Is there an ark in that? Is there an ark in the heavenly temple? Yeah, John saw it. And so Jesus would eventually have to make his transition into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And beloved, when he makes his transition in there, here he's lamb, here he's priest. But beloved, when Jesus returns, he doesn't return as a lamb. Amen? When Jesus returns, he doesn't return as a priest. Just as the high priest went into the, 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 the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, so to our high priest, Jesus Christ, would go in one final act of ministry before he would lay down his priestly garments, lay down his priestly center, censer, and return as Son of King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Beloved, when Jesus returns, he doesn't come back as a lamb. When Jesus returns, he doesn't come back as the priest. When he returns, he comes back as what? As the king, which means there must be a time when Jesus would lay aside his priestly garments, when Jesus would lay aside his priestly function, and he would return as a conquering king. 
But before he does that, there's one final phase of ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Well, when is Jesus going to move into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and begin the cleansing of that sanctuary and the judging of his people? The vindic Remember what we already saw in Daniel chapter 7. Judgment is given in favor of the saints. When is that going to happen? We've seen tonight that it would begin at the end of the 2300 days. Can you say amen? You say, well, why is God allowing this to come to light now? I think there's a variety of reasons, and one of the reasons is this. It's to get our eyes off of the earthly system and off of the earthly priests, the apostate power. Everybody's thinking earthly, 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 and then our attention is suddenly directed to Jesus, our great high priest in heaven. Amen. You say amen? amen? It's also the last time prophecy in the Bible. The very next thing to happen in God's great big PDA, his, his, his great big day planner, the very next thing is the second coming of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? And we don't know. You say, well, when does that happen, David? I don't know. Only the Father knows. But I know this. He's coming. And I... When that judgment takes place, when Jesus lays aside for the last time his priestly robe, when Jesus lays aside that priestly garb and that priestly censer, I want to be sure that I'm right with Jesus. Amen. Not because of who I am, but because of who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. See, there's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of finality. There's a sense that the Lord is coming soon. There's also a sense that this isn't the time to be playing religious games. I mean, think of it. If we're living in the judgment hour, if we've been living in that, in that day of atonement, this would not be time to be playing games with God. Amen? This is time to be serious with God. And nobody in this room likes to have fun more than David Ashrick. Right. I love to have fun. But beloved... There's a time for fun and there's a time for being serious. There's a time for enjoying ourselves and having a great time, you know, and, and sitting down to the big meals and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also a time to being sure that our soul is right with our Creator and our Maker. I believe Jesus is soon to come. I believe that with all my heart. If you look at the various lines of evidence that we presented in this prophecy seminar, you have to believe we're living at the end whether it's the signs of the times or the, the, the uh, prophecy of Daniel 2, the prophecy of Daniel 7, the prophecy of Daniel 8, the prophecies of Revelation 13, and we still have other prophecies to go, but you look at all of the converging prophecies, the great signs of the times, like labor pains and that budding fig tree increasing in frequency and intensity, you have to believe we are living down at the close of earth's time. And God is sending a message. He's saying Jesus has entered into the final phase, into the last phase as our great high priest. He's not going to come back as lamb. He's not going to come back as priest. He returns without sin unto salvation. He returns as a king. But beloved, listen. Listen, listen, listen. He'll only be your king if he was your lamb and your priest. Amen? Amen? You want to reign with Jesus? Do you want to be a citizen of Jesus' kingdom? Then you need to be a servant of Jesus today. Amen. If he's not your lamb, he's not your priest. Remember, the only sins that were forgiven on the Day of Atonement were those that went in. The others, what, what happened to those who hadn't put their sins in? Cut off. It was a day of solemn judgment for Israel. And if my calculations are correct, and I, I think they're dead on, beloved, that means we're living right here, right here, in that time just before the return of Jesus. And I want Jesus to be my lamb. Amen? I can't, I can't work my way to heaven. I'm not good enough. And neither are you. Not a person in this room good enough to earn your way to heaven. Your righteousness doesn't even come close to the infinite righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you need a lamb. But the lamb died, and then Jesus takes that blood into the heavenly sanctuary and ministers as our priest. You need a priest, too. See, Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but you need a priest today, don't you? Yeah, I need, when I get down on my knees today, I don't just need a God that did something back in history. I need a God that's doing something today. I need a priest. And I need a priest who's going to say one day, here I come. 
coming back to get my boy, coming back to get my daughter. Everyone who's going to make their decision has made their decision. Those people that would rather have this life and what this world has to offer, they've made their decision. God's not going to bend their arm. It's God will say, okay. But for those who love me, and those who've been looking for my return, and those who were not satisfied with the things of this earth, but felt that there was something bigger, something grander, something more, something better, I'm going to go back and get my people. I want to take them home. Let not your heart be troubled, young people. Let not your heart be troubled, ladies. Let not your heart be troubled, men. Let not your heart be troubled, those of you who are older. You believe in God, believe also in Jesus. In his Father's house, there are many mansions, and he's gone to prepare a place for you. He's preparing it. And if he goes and prepares a place for you, he, he has promised to come again and to receive you unto himself, that where he is, you can be also. You want to be there? You want to be there? Don't put it off. Don't put it off. We're at the end. We're at the end. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're putting our confidence and our trust in Jesus. He's the one. Nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross of Christ we cling. And oh God in heaven, we have seen tonight a bevy of biblical information, but Father, behind the information, there's a Savior. And Father, we pray that you would be directing our minds and riveting our minds to Jesus, Amen. our Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, our High Priest, whoever lives to make intercession, our Judge who gives us the verdict of not guilty, not because of us, but because of Him, and our King of kings and Lord of lords, who's returning as a conqueror to take his captive children home. Father, we need all of them. In this world gone insane, in this world spinning out of control, we need all of them. We need a lamb, we need a priest, we need a judge, and we need a king. And Father, we can find none better in the universe than you and your Son. And so we accept them, again now here. In Jesus' name, and by his righteousness, let everyone say, Amen and Amen.